have entered the realm of the gods. So give us your mind and your full attention. So you say you deal with esoteric information? I never heard of such. Well, you're in for a treat. Blah talk, blah talk, this is the blah talk. I lean hell bay dropping jewels every day. Blah talk, blah talk, this is the blah talk. Metaphysical, we deal with the spiritual. Blah talk, blah talk, this is the blah talk. I lean hell bay dropping jewels every day. Blah talk, blah talk, this is the blah talk. Metaphysical, we deal with the spiritual. So you claim to be a god? Damn right I'm a god. The maker, the owner, cream of the planet Earth, father of civilization, god of the Tune in or lose, friend. All strategies apply mathematically. The information he drop is real powerful. So get your notepad, it's more than an hour full. Watch your jaw, the crew with watch the talk. Indigenous to the land, wherever we stand. First world order, we bring it at home in the first quarter. Invisible lines don't apply, we cross borders. Silly rabbit, knowledge for God. No matter where you resign, Mars, Temple of Mars. So don't fret or proceed with hesitation. Just tune in to Blog Talk to get the information. Peace. Whether you suffer from pain in your back, the aches in your knees. Come on down and purchase you some ancestral tea to get rid of all the parasites, toxins, and fleas. Spiritual elevation for cosmic gravitation. So put away the patience, because there's no time to be wasted. Shaolin, 
Nation. Double MC is the Abbott. More rich be the nation. Black men's land, we gotta have it. Restore the throne. I'd rather kick the savage. When disaster strikes, actual facts he can't manage. A fool's on deck, sink ships like Titanic. Spread a fear across the land, causing a justified panic. A monster brain dead zombies. Grab the spits of bandits while these wicked overseas collect residuals in their hammock. Corporate folks forever remain rancid. Poisoning to the mind, afflicted subconscious damage. I'm Melchizedek, moving through 50 states. Only transmitters with the gods I relate. Mental alchemists watch love conquer hate. I am in a golden rays above my head to figure eight. I'm Melchizedek, moving through 50 states. Only transmitters with the gods I relate. Mental alchemists watch love conquer hate. I am in a golden rays above my head to figure eight. Return of the ancient one, the Moorish Naga, the Dragon Rider, a breathing fire, generator, operator, destroyer, a self lord and master, instructor, a Kama Sutra, practice in Tantra, a Kriya Yoga, a Kutalini, the Resurrector, Shishuna, the Eater, Pingala, awaken the seven chakra to come to Avatar, Muhammad the Conqueror, put a sword to your juggler, send you to the ether, the water, air, fire, bender, the earth ruler, I shit in the new era. In the saga, I spirit terror, every sound of horror, reflection crack mirrors, minds made feeble, dreams crumble, the curse tremble, thieves in the temple, raise the mental, beyond the four devils, you whack motherfuckers. Peace to the gods. You already know, man. Yeah. 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 Bohemian wizardry, you fraud them thieves be killing me. The enemy is close, we both lies on our identity. I feel like he who stepped, architect like M. Hotel. Son had the son himself, the guard deadly with the art. I fit dark with a slit heart. You can feel it in your bone marrow before the shit starts. Standing in the cold with a scroll that was written in gold. Behold the old glimpse that was never untold. Infinite like the eight, seven dwelling in your melon. No felon, though the unrighteous say that I'm rebellious. I'm primal, my rhyme suicidal. I worship no idol. My style, a load of gems going down in a spiral You stuck in your roof, my intelligence passed my cool The God is the truth, every time I step in the booth You stepped on the stoop, got scooped and swooped in my loop Do the knowledge, whack them seeds, get played like flu It was the son of the saw, a gift from the gods Who rules flying through the sky with golden wings Submerged into the light, not everybody go to king With the scepter of justice, melanin cultivating she Until we are ethereans, finally becoming one With the righteous sun, so law, souls are raw Magnificent glow with unconditional love Scattered rays for days from the heavens above So below, the souls just trapped in the lowest depths of hell Incarnated into 76 trillion cells To break free, we must be refined Masculine and feminine properties combined The devil is the author of confusion 183,000 divisions the religion, denomination sets post schisms and isms. Yo, isn't it written in the Bible that Jesus spoke in parables? The scriptures and gospels aren't just historical. Many passages weren't meant to be taken literal. Most of it is allegorical based on esoteric principles. Baptist versus Methodist, Pentecostal holiness versus Jehovah Witness, Mormons versus Seven Day Advances, skeptics, atheists, and agnostics, divine and constant tactics of the reptilians, lower fourth dimensional aliens. So beware of the draconian Satanists. Yo, they aim to imprison all true beings through ignorance. So we crush the head of Leviathan. Battle my control. To fill them with suggestions, brainwashing and indoctrinations, using religious politics, education, economics, health and labor, entertainment and war, no sex and law. In this chessboard game called Life, we've all been pawns. Puppets on strings controlled by demonic spawns. You can't run with the devil and walk with God. You can't run with the devil and walk with God. You can't run with the devil and walk with God. You can't run with the devil and walk with God. You can't run with the devil and walk with God. You can't run with the devil and walk with God. You can't run with the devil and walk with God. Back once again with your host, Dr. Aline Bay. First World of Radio, no doubt we are here, and we're going to go in tonight. We have Professor Walter Williams with us once again. This is definitely going to be a blissful educational night, so make sure you have your pens and your paper, because we're going to go in. But before we go in, let me bring on my co-host, Brother Fahim L. Brother Fahim, are you here? Hey, hey how are you? Watch your eyes. Yeah, I'll tell you, watch your How you doing tonight, huh? Doing very well, brother. How you doing, God? Doing good, doing good. 
All right. All right. So we're going to get into tonight, y'all, and we're going to get into these various uh, monotheistic belief systems and their corruption, as well as any other questions that you would like to know about, because I'm pretty sure Professor Walter Williams will be able to answer your questions. So if you need to call in, that number is 626-414-3535. That's 626-414-3535. Give us a call in. And now I'm going to bring on my guest, Professor Walter Williams. Are you in the house? Yes, uh, Brother Aleem, I'm here. All right, all right, all right. I'm glad you are, brother. I'm glad that we got everything straight um, beyond the technical difficulties, and we have you back in the house once again. It's definitely a blissful situation, and I know you got a lot of for tonight. So, you know, wherever you want to start at, you definitely can begin. Well, I can start wherever you uh, direct me to start the conversation about uh, religion, the three major Western religions, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, uh, the Bible, the Old New Testament Bibles, uh, the Holy Quran, Sefer HaTorah. Uh, you know, we can talk about a number of subjects such as who is this man called God, uh, things like that. Uh, when did uh, Christianity come to Ethiopia, et cetera, et cetera, and when did uh, the philosopher Jews were created there in uh, in Ethiopia, how it went and who did that, and so forth and so on. So we have a variety of topics that we can, uh, you know, talk about, and then we can go forward into bringing out information concerning those topics. Uh, All right. That, well, let's uh, get into the origin of major world religions coming from out of Ethiopia, Kush. Oh. Uh-huh. Um, Kush or Ethiopia, oh, okay. Abyssinia. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, Abyssinia, Ethiopia. Uh, mm-hmm. Christianity first came to Ethiopia uh, in 1829, in the middle of the uh, of the 19th century. Um, the Church of England in 1799 created. Uh, a missionary society. In fact, it created two of them, the CMS, Church Missionary Society of the Church of England, 1799. Ten years later, they created what is known as the CMJ uh, in 1809, uh, Church Missionary Judaica Society. So uh, in 1829, um, the church... Missionary Society, or the CMS, from the Church of England, began to send missionaries into Ethiopia uh, under the leadership of Samuel Gobat. And in 1829, he went into that country. Um, and what he did, he found resistance in that country because the Ethiopians or the Abyssinians already had their uh, culture uh, all set up and set in place. So they really didn't want any foreigners over there because they were not used to foreigners in that country. So um, even when the Ptolemies were in charge of Egypt and Northeast Africa, Northeast Africa is called the Middle East today. Northeast Africa is, is where Turkey, Syria, uh, Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait, Iran, um, all is located over there in Palestine and the West Bank, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they uh, were not invaded by the Ptolemies, the Greek Ptolemies. The Greek Ptolemies were in power for 302 years before the Romans came in, in 30 B.C., the Romans came in 30 B.C. and set up what is known, uh, long story short, set up what is known as the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine emperors didn't go into Ethiopia. Um, so uh, even when the Ottoman Turks took over and usurped land from the Byzantine emperors and, and, and usurped land from the Byzantine Empire, 
they didn't go into Ethiopia. You see, so Ethiopia uh, historically has never been colonized by Europeans until uh, in 1780. Uh, James Bruce, a Scotchman, went down the Red Sea and entered Ethiopia or Abyssinia looking for the source of the Nile River. So he wrote a five-volume book entitled In Search of the Nile in 1790. He published it, those uh, five volumes. The next known European historically to go in, into Ethiopia or Abyssinia was uh, George Annesley, who took a hydraulic uh, exposition down the Red Sea and entered Ethiopia. From that point, uh, he was looking for natural resources. And if they found any, um, there was plenty over there. Uh, he wanted to eventually take them under his control, uh, typical European. Um, the third known historical individual to go into Ethiopia was a man by the name of Henry Salt, who was sent in there by the British government uh, to survey the land of Ethiopia, to make maps, looking for natural resources, so he could come back, which he did, and make a report to the British government as to what he found in Ethiopia. Um, then, let's go back to 1799, uh, where the Church of England uh, began to organize, like I said, uh, the CMS. Uh, Church Missionary Society, 1799. Nine years later, they created the CMJ, um, which is the Church Missionary Judaica Society. Um, in 1829, the Church of England sent the first missionaries into Ethiopia to try to convert uh, the Ethiopians or the Abyssinians become Christian. That was a failure. Mm. They rejected that attempt to do that to them. So, uh, in 1838, two doctors from England came into Ethiopia. Dr. C.W. Eisenberg and Dr. L.C. Kraft. They came in there to survey and learn the culture of the Ethiopians. Dr. Eisenberg went back to England, and he wrote a Hamaric dictionary, uh, which he used Hamaric words, uh, Ethiopian words, uh, and then he put next to it the English translation. So they were over there setting up English-speaking schools over there for the sole purpose of enforcing and bringing Christianity into Ethiopia. Now, in 1855, uh, there was an Ethiopian by the name of Lyle, L-I-J, Gassa, who the British had made the first emperor of Ethiopia, and they gave him a new name of Theodore II. Mm. And he was the first emperor of Ethiopia in 1855. Samuel Goldbat, with his uh, missionaries over in Ethiopia, asked by way of, of a courtesy call, Theodore II, can I bring missionaries into your country to teach your people a uh, religion, religion called Christianity? He says, okay, 
as long as you don't bring no preachers over here. Huh. Now, that was in 1855. Uh, three years later, Dr. L.C. Kraft came back into Ethiopia in 1858, three years later, after 1855. And he brought one of his students with him, Martin Plaid, P-L-A-D, who he introduced uh, to Martin Plaid, his student, Ethiopia and the people of Ethiopia and the culture of Ethiopia. And he, uh, Martin Plaid, stayed over there uh, until he went back to England. And while back in England, we're talking about 1858, he got married and he came back to Ethiopia with 29 camels, I'm sorry, 29 donkeys laden with Hamaric Bibles. But he's setting this Christianity up over here. Wow. Then in 1860, uh, the CMJ, the Church Missionary Society of the Church of England, sent a man uh, over in Ethiopia by the name of Henry Aaron Stern. Henry Aaron Stern went among the Gala tribe. The Gala tribe today are known in history as the Falashas. And the Gala tribe uh, uh, reneged or refused to be put upon them, to have uh, put upon them a religion that we know today as uh, Judaism or Hebrewism or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they were taught by way of force. Messianic Judaism, uh, which the Gala tribe refused to accept uh, until they until they kept stand over there using all kinds of tricks in the book to get them to convert from their natural uh, custom into something that's man-made and unnatural religion. Okay, and um, uh, the Gala tribe uh, is now known in history as the Falashas. Okay, and they fought uh, Henry Aaron Stern to the point where he got frustrated with them, and uh, he began to. Uh, attacked them by way of verbiage. And it got to the point where uh, the Gala tribe members began to physically attack Henry Aaron Stern. And they, uh, and Theodore II, who was now the, the, the emperor, the first emperor of Ethiopia, had Henry Aaron Stern, and Martin Platt was his assistant. And they had both put in jail over there in Ethiopia. Now, in the meantime, Theodore II had written a handwritten letter to the, the Queen of England. And he had his hand delivered. And he was waiting for a reply. And she never replied to him. And that irritated him and infuriated him and to the point where he said, that I hate all white people. They are no good. They are my enemy. And then that's when the British government sent an army over there in Ethiopia to confront uh, it or two and to get the release of uh, Henry Aaron Stern, who it or two had put in jail, and along with Martin Platt. Uh, to get the release of both of these men. And at the same time, uh, the British government told Martin, I'm sorry, told uh, 
did or two, that what he did by way of acts was un- unacceptable to them. And Theodore or two uh, showed up mysteriously dead in 1868. Mm. You see? So uh, without going on further uh, into this conversation about this subject, um, that is how uh, Ethiopia got to be Christianized. So when you hear people, uh, I hear a lot of them, uh, African scholars, they say, uh, the first Christians were the Coptic uh, Christians from Ethiopia. That's not true, historically incorrect. But anyway, that's what I have to say about that at this point, Brother Bay. Right. So now I know where they got that information from. That was from um, Christ Before Christianity by John G. Jackson, um, as well as also some other information. So. Uh, I know some of those historians or scholars stated that, you know, that Ethiopia had Christianity 300 years before the Catholic Church. Um, are they not, they not talking about Christianity, of course, like what you were, like what you're talking about about, um, you know, the Christianity in which that we see now or have experienced within modern day time, but they're talking about the concepts of what has become known as Christianity, which came from the ancient mystery school, right or right or uh, right or wrong, or co- you know, am I correct? No, you're not, because okay, uh, Christianity, mm-hmm. uh, the first Christians on earth are the male Coptic Egyptians right. who created who created that image of Serapis, now known as Jesus the Christ. They were mm-hmm. your first Christians that. Uh, when they made this Serapis into the Christ at the Council of Ephesus in 431. So when that uh, happened, uh, they also created a, 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 a created creatures of the Virgin Mary as a mother of this Serapis in order to give this Serapis, now known as Jesus the Christ, a human nature. You see? So uh, that is just a... Uh, Look into as to what happened at the Council of Ephesus, and uh, to clear up uh, an understanding about where Christianity began. You see, you have to have a Christ before you can have Christianity. Okay, if you don't have a Christ, you cannot have Christianity, and you don't get a Christ until the Council of Ephesus, when the Monophysites. And the Nestorians argued that the Serapis, now known as Jesus the Christ, had an Osiris-like spirit, but no human nature. In order to have a human nature, one has to be born through the body of a female. So what they did with the African ancient Egyptian divine triad of Osiris, or Osir, the father, Haru, or Horus, the son, the S-U-N, or uh, Isis, or uh, 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 Set, uh, the goddess mother, they began to replace the son, the S-U-N, with this created creature, Serapis, the S-O-N, and they, uh, uh, and they began to replace Isis by replacing Isis and giving uh this created creatures, the Virgin Mary, the attributes of Isis, and they amalgamated, those male Coptic Egyptians, our ancestors, amalgamated the two created creatures together in order for this rapist to have a human nature. And they, the male Kites were speaking Greek, and when they, while they was amalgamating the two created creatures, they said, now, speaking Greek, now this is the Choristos. And in English, the Christos means now this is the Christ. So this is how, in short form, uh, how uh, this Christ came into being at the Council of Ephesus. But then there's a lot of other history prior to getting into the Council of Ephesus, you know. But anyway, that's uh, a short overview of that. Okay, well, let's, let's get into this man called God. 
Okay. Well, uh, people have a misunderstanding about God because um, people are asked, do you believe in God? Well, the average person out there uh, who uh, say, yes, I believe in God, and that is to not to be ridiculed <coughs> by saying, I don't believe in God. Then they're, they're, if you say, I don't believe in God, then people look at you funny. They say, well, this guy, something must be wrong with him. But see, you got to understand, I, and I ask, people they ask me, do you believe in God? I said, what God are you talking about? You see? And they look puzzled. Every religion out here has a God. Christianity uh, has this dear white man on the cross called Jesus Christ as God. And they have, and they said that his father, this invisible uh, father, is God, or, or he's the son of this invisible God. Then you have Allah, the God of uh, the religion called uh, uh, Islam. You have that entity or that name to be used as God. Then you have Yahweh and uh, Jehovah. And you get into Judaism as God. Then you have Buddha as God. And it goes on and on. Oh, now what are they talking about? What are, how are asses of people on earth being misled? You have to know that God is a man. If you don't believe that, Every time an individual speak or use the term and say the word God, they say he, his, or him, and that's true. Then go a little further. If you look up God in the dictionary, it says a male deity. That's your first definition of God in the dictionary, a male deity. You see? Now, um, then they tell you in these uh, religious theology, especially Christianity, that God created the heavens and the earth. No, God uh, cannot do that. God is a man. A man can't do that. A man can't create anything with life in it unless he's made it with a female by way of a sex act. And the female, singularly, can't create anything without the male. Both have to have a sexual encounter in order to bring forth pro-life. Now, they say that God created the heavens and the earth. That's not true. The question has to be asked, is this, a Brother Bay, is this, how and who and, 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 and what created the sky, the stars, the planet? The moon, the sun, air, earth, water, vegetation, animals, and humanity. See, everything I just named is in creation. That is called creation. Now, if you notice, man is in creation, along with animals, vegetation, uh, water, uh, the earth, the, the, the sun, the moon, the planets, uh, the stars, uh, the sky, etc., that's all was created. Now, what created that? I can give you the answer. Very simple. Don't know. It is called the mystery of life. Now, keep in mind, man is in that creation. Okay? Now, the second question has to be asked. Who and where? And what created the first man and the first woman to appear on planet Earth? I can give you that answer. The answer is, I don't know. No human can tell you that no matter what station in life they hold, how much money they have, what degrees they, they may have, they can't answer that question. That is called the mystery of life. You will never, ever know that. Third, when you go to a funeral and look down at the deceased, the question has to be asked, where did the spirit of the deceased individual 
that the funeral that you are attending, where did that spirit go to? I can give you that answer. Don't know. That's called the mystery of life. Let's go to the fourth uh, question that I have to ask people. No human on earth can tell you, Dr. Bay, how they individually got here on earth as a human being. Can't tell you that. Okay? Now, you know that your, that your mother and father have a sexual intercourse. Your father uh, secreted a sperm that uh, impregnated your mother's egg. And all of the nine months of, of, of incubation uh, to bring forth Walter Williams, Dr. Elaine Bay, and every human walking this earth. You've got seven billion humans walking this earth as human beings. Okay? The question has to be asked. Can you tell me, human, how you got here on planet earth? as a human being. Okay? Now, the question I will ask, and I'll start with you, Dr. Bay. At what conscious age, memory, in your thinking that you can uh, tell me and the world, uh, at what age did you find yourself here on planet Earth as a human being? Can you tell me that? Go back in your conscious memory. Right. It was um after the age of one. Okay. Right after the age of two, around that time, between one and two was when I first okay. became conscious. So, yeah. Okay, so between one and two, you find right. yourself here on planet Earth. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So from zero to, to one or two, you have no conscious mm-hmm. memory of that, do you? Huh? Right. Okay. Now, you found yourself at one or two. Living where on planet Earth, Dr. Bay? Um, I was in Brooklyn, New York. Okay, you found yourself between one and two, consciously in Brooklyn, New York. Okay, mm-hmm. and you found yourself belong to a certain race of people, is that correct? Right. Okay, uh, they were called Negroes at that time. Is that right. correct? Okay, yes. now. You multiply, now I told you there are 7 billion humans walking this earth of all races, creeds, and color. You can multiply that to every, your experience, which I have the same experience, only I can consciously, only consciously remember when I was four years old. Okay? So Mm -hmm. from zero to four, I have no conscious memory of Walter Williams. But anyway, you take your experience, and you uh, put it on and ask, uh, and put it on the example of the Chinese. The Chinese cannot tell you how he got into China as a Chinese. He found himself there as a Chinese. The Indians of India cannot tell you how they got into India as an Indian. He found himself in India as an Indian of India. The Africans cannot tell you how uh, uh, they got into the continent of Africa. They found themselves in the continent of Africa as Africans. The Mexicans can't tell you how he got into Mexico as a Mexican. He found himself as a Mexican, and so forth and so on, for every race of people living on planet Earth. Now, do you see what I'm talking about? Does that make sense? It makes a whole lot of sense. Okay. So... Uh, getting back to this, who is this man called God? The God for Dr. Alain Bay is your father. That's who God is for you. God is for you is your mother. The both of them, your, your, your mother and father, created Dr. Alain Bay. My mother and father created Walter Williams. And every human on earth has a mother and father who created them. And each male that took uh, steps in uh, 
having an intercourse with that individual's mother is the God, is their God. So God is a man. So that's what I'm talking about uh, when I speak about who is this man called God. So, Dr. Bay, I hope that clears that up. It definitely does. All right. For anyone who have any questions, give us a call. The first world of radio. The number is six two six four one four thirty five thirty five. That's six two six four one four thirty five thirty five. All right. Um, I guess we get back into it until they start calling in here, um, Professor Williams. Um, so, okay. All right. Let's let's get into the historical origin of Islam. Um, I've read your book several times. Excellent work. Phenomenal. You know. Um, Thank you. And I guess, you know, let's get into some of that information because people still believe in Ahmed Ibn Abdullah, uh, Alameen Mustafa, you know, et cetera, et cetera, known as Prophet Muhammad um, in that regard. You know, um, as a man for 1,400 years ago who the angel Gabriel came to and and dictated to him the Holy Quran, you know, so forth and so on. You know, um, you know, let's let's get to that topic and and you know some of the work that you've put forth in order to help, you know, um, correct some of that misknowledge in which that is taking place. Okay, uh, one has to uh, understand and realize this: when a person wants to debate me on. Islam. I ask him one question. Which Islam are you talking about? One or two Islam? And they look puzzled. You have to start with the first Islam, which was created by uh, Muhyiddin Ibn Ali. Ibn al-Arabi, alias Muhammad. In other words, you have to start with Mohammedanism. That's altogether different from the Islam of today. It's a different history, different set of circumstances. See? So uh, that is your first uh, Islam uh, coming from Ibn al-Arabi, alias Muhammad. You know, you can do a lot of things, a lot of things with an alias. You take, like, uh, Clayton Moore, alias the Long Ranger, uh, William Boyd, alias Hopalong Cassidy, Christopher Reeves, alias Superman, um, so those alias takes on a different history, but the alias is only the character of the human, where the alias come from. So you have the first Islam is coming from Ibn al Arabi, alias Muhammad. Now, I, uh, I wrote about that in my book, The Historical Origin of Islam. It's been out for 13 years. And I, uh, and, and I have a chapter in there that says that um, how they use the, 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 the biography and life of Ibn al-Arabi, alias Muhammad, to get what is known as uh, Islam today. Okay? So now, that's the first thing that one has to study. You get my book. I'm not trying to sell you a book now, but if you want to uh, get my book and understand what I'm saying, the historical origin of Islam, get it, and it's there in between the pages of that book of how Mohammedanism came about and who is Ibn al-Arabi, you see? Well, you can be and, modest, um, Professor Williams, and I'll tell him, go and get the book. Okay. You need to have the book well, in your I, library. If you don't have the book in your library, then... Um, you don't have a library. You need the book, okay. Historical Origin of Christianity, Historical Origin of Christianity, um, and the Historical Origin of Islam, um, as well as 
Um, I know he has another book that will soon come out. I, it's one written by him and his wife, but there's also one in which that was called the Historical Origin of Judaism, um, which I'm sure that he's still in the works of putting together, in which that will probably be out pretty soon. Okay, well, I per- certainly appreciate that little plug there, and uh, uh, I explained to you about the first Islam, which is called Mohammedanism. Okay, now Ibn Al Arabi was born in Spain. He was a Moor, born among uh, the Moorish population of Spain. The Moors, as the world know, are Africans that were asked by white European Spain to come from Morocco and Mauritania, the two countries in North Africa that borders the Mediterranean in 11, uh, I'm sorry, in 1051, 11th century, to come across the Mediterranean to bring civilization to uncivilized heathen Spain. They did that. That was 1051. In 1165, born among them was a man, a young man, by the name of Ibn al-Arabi. His first name was Muhammadan, uh, Ibn Ali. Ibn al-Arabi, alias Muhammad. Now, uh, I write about his life and biography, how they used that to, to create what is known as today's Islam, okay, in my book, The Historical Origin of Christianity. Now, um, in 12, I'm sorry, in 1240, uh, Ibn al-Arabi, alias Muhammad, died. But he was, he had went all over Egypt, a philosophizing, he went all over northeast Africa, today called the Middle East. He went into Syria, Turkey. He went into Arabia, um, Yemen. He went into uh, 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 Lebanon. Well, it wasn't a Lebanon then. But he went all over into Palestine and so forth and so on, philosophizing. Uh, uh, and so a year before he passed, which was 1240, uh, his disciples in 1239 began to spread his doctrine all over uh, uh, and throughout what is known as Northeast Africa, what is known today as the Middle East, and into Egypt. Uh, That went on for um, 61 years, from 1239 to 1300. In 1300, the Ottoman Turks created what is known as the Ottoman Empire, those sultans, created in 1300. They usurped land territories held by the Byzantine emperors. They usurped those lands and brought it under their own control. And in 1300, the, the 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 sultans of and the Ottoman Turks took a sword and went among the conquered and put to the necks of the conquered and said Muhammad or die. In other words, you accept Muhammad or you're going to die. So quite naturally they're going to say Islam alaikum because they got a sword up to their throat. So that's how. Uh, uh, this Mohammedanism began to spread all over Northeast Africa, known today as the Middle East, and throughout uh, Egypt and throughout uh, the other countries that is under the now Valley Civilization, under one umbrella, by what I call the African Ancient Egyptian Commonwealth of 
Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, and Mauritania. They went all across those countries with their sword and said, Muhammad will die. So they became Mohammedanism or Mohammedans. That's how they spread Mohammedan. And then uh, uh, the Moors, the name Moor is only a nickname, a nickname given to those Africans living in Morocco and Mauritania who had went into Spain to set up uh, literacy, which is your first form of civilization. They went in there and set up a, a Spanish government for the, for the Spanish, and they began to build cities all throughout Spain, Seville, Grenada, Toledo, Cadillac, etc., etc. And they also... In the 12th century, they introduced soap to Europe and the Europeans by creating public bathhouses over there in Spain. So now, Ibn al-Arabi, alias Muhammad, was born in that culture in Spain, and he was an African, a Moor, and he began uh, as he grew. He began to come into Egypt. He began to come into Syria, Turkey, Arabia, Yemen, uh, Palestine, etc., uh, preaching or spreading his philosophy. Again, he died in 1240, one year before he passed. His disciples began to spread his philosophy throughout what is known as the Middle East or Northeast Africa and Egypt, okay, until uh, the Ottoman Turks came into power, like I just mentioned. And they took this sword and went up to, uh, because they were usurping land territories from the Byzantine emperors over there. So the land territories that they usurped from the Byzantine emperors had people living there, so they went up to these uh, people, these conquered people, which is sword, and said, Muhammad will die. So quite naturally, uh, they, they don't accept Muhammad because nobody wants to die. And that's how Mohammedanism became into vogue. Okay? Now, let's go and find out where Islam too came in. Islam too came in beginning in 1870 when the AIU, the Alliance Israelite Universal of Paris, France, sent a group of scholars into Syria in 1870 to create literature for the Mohammedans over there, those Arabs, as we call them today. And they remodel. It's like you, like you have a, a, a house. You buy this house, and you completely remodel it. And for it to change, to make a change in this house. So what they did, they used Mohammedanism as a guideline. And they created what is known as the Quran, beginning in 1870. Um, and in fast forward, right after World War I, World War I was 1914 to 1918, uh, created by the British government, who invaded the Byzantine, who invaded the Byzantine emperors over there. And with the excuse of, of of getting back at the Germans, who at that time, just prior to World War One, 1914, 1918, the Germans were helping the uh, the Ottoman Turks build railroads over there in uh, that territory or that land area of Northeast Africa, known as the Middle East today. So they used that as an excuse 
to invade the Ottoman Empire. And they uh, toppled the Ottoman Empire in 1918. Now, in the meantime, uh, the AIU, Alliance Israelite Universal of Paris, France, had created what is known today as the Quran. And that Quran was accepted by the Arab world in 1919 in Egypt. Okay? In that Quran that the Mohammedan world accepted, that was created by Jewish scholars from the AIU and Christian scholars. In that Quran, and in today's Quran, interspersed in today's Quran, you have the Pentateuch and the Psalms interspersed in the Quran today, which is Jewish writings. Interspersed in today's Quran, you have Christian writings, such as the four Christian Gospels. That's what's in there. They tell you a lie about a Muhammad fleeing Mecca in 622, meeting the angel Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel told Muhammad what God wanted Muhammad to pass on to mankind. That's tradition. This will have been done in 622, the flight out of Mecca. There was no Mecca, but I can go into that and so forth and so on. But it's a long story short. That Quran today or uh, Islam today, today's Islam is based upon a book called the Quran. Um, uh, there's a brother out of Minnesota, uh, Ellison. He's a congressman. Um, I, his first name escapes me, but his last name is Ellison. He's the only Muslim in Congress today. And he took an oath to get into Congress by taking an oath right. on a 1919 Quran. That's in the records. So that is a short overview on uh, Quran, I'm sorry, Islam 1 and then Islam 2. Brother hey, Professor Walter Williams, you were saying that there was no Thomas Jefferson Quran that he took, um, that Obama took his oath on the second time, nor the senator. Because they say no, that the Quran supposed to have been Thomas Jefferson's from out of his Correct. library. Correct. Supposed <laughs> to be out of his library. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, uh, it was Keith, right. Keith Ellison. No, Obama didn't take the oath of office to be the president. He took his oath of office to be the president on the Holy Bible because he's a right. Christian. Keith Ellison out of Minnesota took his oath of office on the 1919 Quran that was supposed to have been the Quran of Thomas Jefferson. I repudiate that. So they gave you that date, 1919, okay? And mm-hmm. that's when historically, historically when you in, uh, uh, investigate history like I have done, in 1919, the Arab world accepted this Quran that, that the Jewish scholars out of the AIU created beginning in 1870. AIU means Alliance Israelite Universal of Paris, France. That's uh, what happened. That was, like you said, Thomas Jefferson Quran, supposedly, but I don't accept that. I only accept that it was in 1919 that the Quran that is being used out here today uh, was created by the AIU, Alliance Israelite Universal Jews of Paris, France, beginning in 1870. And for 49 years, uh, the, the Quran was out there. And in 1919, uh, that's when the Arab world accepted that Quran. 
Now, let me bring this to your attention about uh, Islam, today's Islam. After World War One, which ended in 1918, World War One, like I mentioned, began in 1914, ended in 1918. The League of Nations, uh, which the League of Nations today is known as the UN, the League of Nations mandated uh, the territory of Northeast Africa, known today as the Middle East, which is the Middle East is a political name. Uh, they mandated that whole territory except for Syria to the British government in 1920. In 1922, the League of Nations mandated Syria to the French, and the French boarded off a portion of Syria, and they created Lebanon and Beirut out of that uh, uh, divided territory of Syria. In 1920, um, the British government boarded off Iraq and they, I'm sorry, boarded off Arabia and they created Iraq out of that. And they boarded off Iraq and created uh, uh, this other country, Kuwait, uh, to break up that oil reserves over there. You see? So... Uh, that was in 1920. Four years uh, later, they appointed a man by the name of Abdul Aziz Al Saud to be the first king of Arabia, which is named Saudi Arabia. But his name was uh, 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 Al Saud, Abdul. Of Jesus, of these El Sad. And this is what he did, Brother Bay. After two years after being put into power as the uh, first king of Arabia, two years later in 1926, he called the first meeting in Islam's history. And in my book, The Historical Origin of Islam, I give you the minutes of that meeting. And that was the world's first meeting in Islam's history, 1926, and the first Hajj in 1926. It's right there in my book. Mm. The minutes and everything. Brother Bay? Man, well, I, I know some of the Islamic brothers and sisters are is boiling over right now. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. So, I didn't mean to do that to them. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's common sense, like you always said. Uh, mm -hmm. Where we born with a religion, you know. Mm -hmm. If we um, constantly didn't remember anything from age two to four, you know, uh, conscious of ourselves, and we was already here for two to four years, you know, or one to four years, you know, um, we had to think, you know. When did you learn about religion? You know, when did it first come into your mm -hmm. ideology and your philosophy? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when was it you indoctrinated with it, you know, and so forth and so on. So, I mean, that goes back to what you've always um, stated. You know, that's just common sense. And that's what we have to come to um, understanding, you know, that if you want to practice, you know, a religion, then understand it from a scientific point of view, you know, um, you know, if you can gather something from it from that aspect, you know, otherwise it's not doing anything. Just know about some stories about someone that happened, you know, 1,400, 200, 2,000 years ago, 1,400 years ago, or as you just stated, uh, 200 years ago, you know, or et cetera. You know, it's not doing any good. Correct. Now, let me say this, uh, Dr. Bay, is this. Oh. Uh, to clear this up to people that are listening to this broadcast. Uh, like I mentioned, you have 7 billion humans walking this earth of all races, creeds, and color. Um, six, 
billion, 500 million of these people embrace a religion. 500 million of these people not embrace a religion. Now, getting back to what you just mentioned, how does a human being get a religion when that no human on earth was born with a religion? How did you get this? Okay, good question. At the end of the nine months of incubation, you came out of your mother's womb attached to her umbilical cord. That umbilical cord was cut by the doctor to separate you from your mother. When that was done, you had life in your being as a human being. You had life flowing through your veins, flowing flowing through your body. That life was sustained for nine months by that umbilical cord uh, that your mother had attached to you to develop you into a human being. That umbilical cord carried water, air, and food for that nine months of incubation. At the end of that nine months, here you come into this world. You were given life. That's, that is your indwelling, divine, spiritual birthright. When you came out of your mother's womb as a human being, a, a baby, a child, you were given everything to sustain you individually, spiritually, for the rest of your life. You need to go no place to look for it. All you got to do is develop. Now, no human, I want you to understand clearly, I'm not talking to you, Dr. Bay, like that. I'm talking to the listening audience. I want you to understand clearly that no human was born with a religion. So uh, religion, all religions are man-made, created by man to control man's thinking and control his actions. Like Carter G. Wilson said, if you, uh, in order to control, if you can control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. If he's been trained to go to the back and uh, and find a door there, upon arriving at the back, he don't. If he doesn't find a door, he will make one. Okay. So now, man created religions for man. All humans was born spiritually free of all of that. Okay? Now, how did mankind get a religion? Let's let's deal with one religion. We're talking about Christianity, and you can multiply it to every man made religion that's on earth today being practiced by man. Your mother and father who created you, your God and goddess created you um, pass a, to you in your child in your early child innocent age a disease and a virus called religion called Christianity you were in your early child innocent age you couldn't say mom dad I don't want to be a Christian you couldn't say that so here this disease and virus is being passed on to you in your early child innocent age. Why? How did your parents get a religion? Because your grandparents did it to your your parents. And your grandparents' parents, which is your great-grandparents, did it to your grandparents. And it goes back, 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 back. So here you are today with a big cross around your neck and a dead white man on it. You don't know how you got to be a Christian. Here you're talking about Islam Malakim. You don't know anything about Islam Malakim. Here you're talking about you some kind of black Hebrew Israelite. Know nothing about that. Here you're talking about you some kind of uh, Jew. Don't know nothing about that. No such thing. So forth and so on. These are all man-made religion. I'm a Buddhist. Man-made religion. So how did you, how does one get a religion, Doctor Bay? It's, it, that the disease and virus is passed from their parents to them. So today you have these Christians out here today, you have these uh, Muslims out here today, you have these black Israelites out here and Jews and so forth and so so on. So that's how the people or mankind get mm. religion. 
Dr. Bay? Indeed. Um, Brother Hell, you have any questions? Well, like I said, uh, well, it's very well, uh, everything's been very well said by uh, Brother uh, Walter Williams. Uh, he, it's, it's really amazing how he can just uh, say all that by memory. I wish I could do that. No. So, uh, it's practice. It's practice, okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, so. Well, I can say it, just keep on doing the study and what you're doing and dropping the science on people. Thank you so All much, right. my brother. Yeah. And we have a call. It's area code 410. Area code 410. Okay. I'm, greetings, I'm you're on the air. Gre- gre- greetings, brothers. Greetings, honestly. Greetings. Uh, the pan. Um. Uh, like the uh, Walter Williams, uh, first and foremost, I want to say greatly appreciate the work you done you done uh, bolstered to the to the years, and uh, probably don't recognize the voice, but I, I was saying before that that um, from you was the reason I found Dr. Aleem show the, the very first first time like years ago, but. Um, yeah, my phone, my battery is getting a little low, so I just got a, a quick question. Uh, well, I, well, you just mentioned something about Buddhism. Could could you expound a little bit, uh, as far as you know, the uh, antiquity of Buddhism, like um, uh, the the whole uh, Christ-like, uh, you know, uh, Buddha being born. With a, a mother with the name of M, um, you know it's, it's, it's so mythical. You know, you know it's more allegory the way the Shakyamuni Buddha was uh, born. But if you could expound a little bit, much as you can on it. Well, you have to. By the way, thank you for your call. And you're calling from Baltimore, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you have to remember when you study uh, and go into these religions such as Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and now Buddhism, you find that uh, Buddha's mother was a uh, she was a virgin. Okay, uh, and uh, so she never had sex, even though she was married. This is how the story goes now. And that she was walking in her garden one day, and she. Uh, sat down and leaned against a tree and fell asleep. And when she woke up, she was pregnant. So <laughs> it's no use to be going into something that's untrue, which is based off of mythology. Okay? So uh, uh, his mother is supposed to have practiced celibacy, and that means not having sex with a man, even though she was married. And uh, this falling, walking in her garden, and sitting down and leaning against a tree, falling asleep, waking up, she was pregnant with this Buddha. Okay? So that's how, uh, that's a little overview without going too far in uh, in depth with this lie about Buddhism. So that's what I have to say to that. Um, and... and Okay, the other quick question from my, my uh, battery clock out. Um, uh, uh, deviating a little bit off the topic, um, Egypt. Um, I can't wait to get you. You know, whenever you come out with the book and about um, the the book on Egypt, you're gonna do. But um, now, now I I don't listen to a you know a good amount of hours of um, uh, these discussions. But let me just make sure I have your position correct. As far as the uh, the hieroglyphs in Egypt, um, uh, are you saying that there will never be a decipherment of, of these um, these glyphs? I mean, you got brothers spending their whole lives trying to de- decipher this stuff. And you, are you saying that there will never be uh, any type of decipherment of these hieroglyphs? Uh Yes, I'm saying that, but first I have to ask the question. Has the hieroglyphics, in your opinion, been deciphered? 
and how were they deciphered? That's the question you have to ask these brothers. In your opinion, brothers, have the hieroglyphics ever been deciphered? And how were they deciphered? Okay, based on what? That's the, that's the question. In my book, Historical Origin of Christianity, on page 146, I write an appendix, a chapter called the appendix. Uh, that's the title of that appendix chapter is saying, uh, Why the Meta Nature Hieroglyphics Has Never Been Deciphered. Mm-hmm. One reason why I'm saying that they will never ever be deciphered, first, they are pictorial symbols. You would have to ask the ancient Egyptian what he or she meant for them to be when they drew those symbols. Okay? You have to ask them. And they are not around for us to ask. So that's the reason why I say they'll never be deciphered. Now, a symbol, Western academia has been putting alphabet to symbols. You can't put an alphabet to a symbol. It's impossible, okay? The only way you can uh, understand or say anything about a pictorial symbol is that you have to know the meaning of that symbol. That's the only way you can explain that symbol if you know the meaning of that symbol, okay? You can't go like the symbol of the question mark. Everybody knows the symbol of the question mark. Is that correct? Hello? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah, the is. symbol of a question mark, You can can you put an alphabet to that symbol, like uh, 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 M, T, P, W, S, Y, or anything like that? Can you attach an a alphabetical uh, equivalent to that uh that symbol that we know today as the question mark. Can you do that? No. Hello? Yes, yeah, I did. Tell me yes or no. Can you do no. that? You can't do that, can not, you? No, not really. All right, so now, all I'm, when I come on the air or any radio station and I give the information out, I'm giving this information out to provoke thought in people. I want you to evolve. I don't want our people in the African community to, to continue to revolve. I want you to evolve. When you evolve, you're growing. And the only way you can grow is that you have, have new information brought to the table so you can understand what it's about. Now, I will make a suggestion. Get my book, The Historical Origin of Christianity, and turn to page 146 and see why I am saying that the meta nature hieroglyphics has never been deciphered. Check it out and study it over and over until you can internalize the message and understand the message that I wrote in that chapter. That's my answer to you. Any other questions? Okay, brother, in the uh, the, the Egyptian book, do you, you have a... Uh a prognostication when the uh, the the book on Egypt will be up. The book that my wife and I are writing. Yes, sir. That book now is being edited by uh, my wife and I, and we're getting it uh, camera ready to be printed, and we are also uh, uh, putting it in our illustrations that we want in there. So it's it's a slow process because you work on it today, then the phone will ring and it says somebody had passed in your family or something like that, and you got to take two weeks out to deal with that, you know, and then you, you mm-hmm. then you uh, something else will come up and throw you all. Then by the time you get back to it, a whole month has gone by. You see, so it is a slow process with us. But it's well worth it because there's a wealth of information that we are putting in this book that you cannot get no place else on planet Earth. And uh, please be patient with us. Uh, it's coming out, but please be patient with us. And I thank you for your enthusiasm 
into and your interest into uh, the book that my wife and I are co-authoring, which is called uh, uh, it's entitled "The Spelling Myths of Ancient Egypt." Lots of information there. Talking about the repudiation of the Hyksos, and also I'm telling you and uh, warning to all African scholars: do not use the chronologies of ancient Egypt, because the ancient Egyptians never wrote a chronology of themselves. The chronologies of ancient Egypt was created by Western academia using the Bible. And I put five uh, different chronologies in this book to give you an example. So be patient, and you're in for to receive a whole lot of information. So thank you again, my brother. All right, family. Maya Hotep. Maya Hotep. Maya Hotep, my brother. Brother Bay? Yes, I'm here. All right. Um, for those that want to call in, give us a call at 626 414 3535. That's 626 414 3535. You should have lots of questions. Um, so once again, give us a call. It's 626-414-3535. All right? Um, Brother L, you have any questions? Well, yeah. Uh, what, what do you say about uh, this French? Uh, I think he was a – I'm not sure what he was, but his Chimpoli. name was Compilion. Compilion. Francois. Francois Compilion. Compilion. Both had to cipher something about the uh, – uh, Egyptian uh, metadetters or what they call hieroglyphics. Okay, well, again, I refer you to my book, the Historical Origin of Christianity, on page 146, why uh, the metadetter hieroglyphics has never been deciphered. And I mentioned uh, Francois Campolion in that book. Okay. So in 1822, when he came out identifying seven or nine letters of the glyphs, those pictorial symbols called the hieroglyphs, um, his colleagues in Western academia did not accept his interpretation of the decipherment of the hieroglyphics. So uh, until 44 years later, they supposedly have found another bilingual stone called the Stone of Canopus. And in my book, in that chapter, I ask Western academia, where is the Stone of Canopus? They can't produce one. I've never seen one. In all of the 41 years of my life researching this subject, I've never seen one. So I asked the question to them, where is this uh, Stone of Canopus. So when they said that in 1866, when they, uh, 44 years after uh, uh, repudiation of Champollion's decipherment of the hieroglyphs, they said, oh, now, he did decipher the hieroglyphs. No, uh uh-uh, uh, because of the Stone of Canopus. I can't, they have never produced one. You see? Um, then, in that same chapter that you will read, go on, I want you to read it and study it. I talk about Adolf Ehrman, who's a German, uh, Egypt, uh, I won't call him Egyptologist. He's a German uh, individual who was the curator of the Berlin Museum in Berlin, Germany. He was the curator of ancient Egyptian antiquities or ancient Egyptian artifacts at the Berlin Museum. In 1880, he was the first one to come out with what is known as the grammatical dictionary of the hieroglyphs, and I'll talk about him in this chapter. So in 1924, they revised that uh, uh, dictionary of the hieroglyphs grammatical dictionary of the hieroglyphs that Ed Ehrman came out with. And in 1935, they revised it again. In the meantime, in 1899, 
E. E. Wallace Burge came out with his Book of the Day. E. E. Wallace Burge was a curator of the British Museum at that time. So this is where E. E. Wallace Burge got some of his uh, so-called decipherment of the hieroglyphs from uh, Adolf Ehrman, the German. And you also have to understand, which is not, which will be in my new book coming out, about the Reba system. The Reba system uh, was a system created by the consensus of German scholars. Okay? Um, such as the teacher of Adolf Ehrman called Richard Lepsius and other German scholars. They used what is known as the Reba system, and I explain all of that in my book, how they use that system to come out with the supposed decipherment of the hieroglyphs by way of grammatical formation. So you have to do uh, some research, you have to do some study, but you got to research and study in the right places, and you've got to be able to analyze what you're reading. You just can't take what everybody tells you. It sounds good, but now you've got, to put, you've got to take in what they're saying over here, and you've got to, you've got to place it over in another area of, of history to see if it match. You see, and so forth and so on. So anyway, that's what I have to say to that, my brother. All right. Brother Bay? All right, so once again, if you have any questions, give us a call. All right, that's 626-414-3535. That's 626-414-3535. All right, we have a call online. Area code 540. 540, you're on the air. Hey, how your brother's doing uh, this evening or the tonight? Very well, brother. How you doing? Uh, wonderful to hear from you, uh, Professor Williams, Dr. Bay, and uh, Brother Fahim. Good to talk to you all. Uh, this is uh, James. I'm calling from uh, ATL. Uh, Professor Williams, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you mentioned uh, Christianity taking over uh, Ethiopia closer to the 18th century. No, wait, wait, you, uh, wait, wait, was that, was wait, 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 wait. I said that Christianity came into Ethiopia in the middle of the 19th century, 19th which is 18. See, the 19th century is 1800s. Yes, sir, I know. I, I, my okay. apologies. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, what are your opinions on uh, the churches uh, that were built there supposedly in the you know earlier 700s and on, like uh, Lalibela and the, uh, what's that, St. George's Church that's uh, built into the earth down in Ethiopia. Can you kind of speak on that a little bit? Sure. You're talking about uh, those 11 rock hue churches mm -hmm. that are 20 feet down in the ground. Correct. But they were not built as churches. It was built as temples. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to tell you who, what family built those 11 rock hue churches. That are known okay. as temples that are known as churches today. It was the Zagwe family of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Zagwe, Z A G W E family. Okay. Beginning in in eleven thirty five, they began to go twenty feet into the in the ground mm -hmm. uh, to uh, build a temple to the patriarchs of their family. When one, when, when, a patri when a person die in their family, you become a patriarch. So he, they went down into the ground and they built a temple to that individual. So that went on for 135 years, from 1135 to 1270. And the last one was uh, Arabella. Okay. So that was the 11th. Uh, temples, not churches. Now, when Christianity came into Ethiopia in the uh, in the middle of the 19th century, 1855 mm -hmm. to be historically correct, later years as uh, Christianity was accepted.
left it by way of force among the Ethiopians, uh, the Church of England, and those missionaries named those temples, temples now, okay. named them churches and gave them European names, St. Matthew and St. This and so forth and so on. That's how they became became Christian churches. Okay. Um, and kind of building on that, can you uh, maybe go a little bit into, uh, I guess, the symbolism pre-Christianity of the cross um, as far as Ethiopia is concerned? Because, uh, you know, those buildings, are, some of them are built specifically in those shapes and I'm not a Christian or anything any longer, <laughs> but uh, I know somebody's like, oh, what is built like a cross? <laughs> what? Uh, the the shapes of them, you know, some of them are built in, you know, they're cross, built in cross shapes or whatnot. All um, I'm saying to you which, is that when Christianity came into Ethiopia in the middle of the 18th century, they mm-hmm. tampered with those churches, I mean, those temples okay. down there to make them into churches, to make the world populace believe that the, uh, that the Ethiopian, Coptic Ethiopians, were the world's first Christians. That's what they did. So you can't, okay. like they tampered, they went into, into Egypt. The University of Chicago in 1922 built a building over in, 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 in Egypt, Cairo, Egypt, I believe. It's called the White House. They built that building to house their scholars coming over there studying our ancestors' history and culture. They closed down temples over there, and they put in those temples the things that they want the general public to see that will coincide with their lives that they got here and spread on planet Earth. So don't go by that. They tampered with those temples, those temples down there. Okay, so they did some rebuilding on them then. The, hey, the, you got it. There we go. Okay, and that 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 clears up something for me then for sure. Then I appreciate the uh, the the wealth of wisdom that you hold, and I'm uh, interested to see what you got on uh, Egypt because uh, you're about to stir up a whole another pot. But uh, I think you enjoy doing that, and we appreciate it. <laughs> Where are you call, calling from now? Uh, well, I have a Virginia area code, but I'm actually living in Atlanta right now. Okay, I got you. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have my two books, Historical Origin of Christianity, Historical Origin of Islam? Uh, not yet, but it uh, looks like I got something to go get some homework to do. <laughs> okay, well, hop to it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for uh, taking my call, and uh, you brothers have a wonderful night. All right. Okay, and may I hold up to you, my brother? Uh, hotel to you as well, my hotel. Please. All right, all right. All right, see, there's coming up with some good questions. So for those who have questions, give us a call, 626-414-3535. Um, that's 626-414-3535. All right? Okay, I guess we continue building for right now until someone calls in. All right. All right. Uh, so we basically got into Christianity. We got into Islam. Let's get into Judaism. Um, let's see what we can find out about that historical origin of Judaism and yeah. and uh, where that comes from as far as yeah. the belief system. You know, well, you, you stated earlier that there was no so-called Jews in that regard. So, you know, where do they get these mythologies from or these um, particular allegories. Well, let me explain to, this, to you, uh, Dr. Bay, is this. To be honest with you, the reason why I have not written a book called The Historical Origin of Judaism, because you cannot write it. Okay? You cannot write The Historical Origin of Judaism. If you try to do that, then what you're doing in essence, is revolving in the same mess that's out here. You have to come to a realization and understanding 
that the historical origin of Judaism cannot be written. Okay? Now, why do I say that? Because you've got too many components involved. Because the only place that you find Jews is in the Bible, in a narrative story. That's the only way you find Jews. There's never been any human Jews walking the earth that's stated in the Bible. No, sir. No such thing. You see? So you have to come to that realization first. Then one has to study the Lombards. Then one has to study the Bible where Jews come from, the story of Jews, such as uh, the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Are you familiar with the story of Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible, uh, Dr. Bay? Yes, I am. Okay. It says that in 587, uh, coming out of Babylon, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, went into Judea, which is Jerusalem, and took the Jews out of Judea and took them into Babylon and put them into slavery. Then the story goes on to say that Cyrus II, the great of Persia, in 536 went into Babylon, which is Babylon is only biblical. There's no place on earth that you can find a geographical land area called Babylon and Mesopotamia and all that other biblical uh, language. That Cyrus too went into Babylon, took the Jews out of Babylon and took them back to Judea to build their second temple. Now that's the story of Nebuchadnezzar, the story of Cyrus II the Great, the story of Jews. You follow me? Now, if an individual, see, you've got to remember this, Dr. Bay, that the Bible is a book that one has to believe in. The Quran is a book that one has to believe in. The Sefer HaTorah is a book that one has to believe in. So getting back to where the story is located in the Bible about Jews. So if an individual picks up the Bible, and read that story. That individual has created a human Jew in, in his life, in his thinking. He, he did that. You, you, are you following me? Yeah. The individual who believes that story in the Bible, any story, that story becomes real in that individual human's life. See, uh, so uh, you have to study uh, capitalism. You have to study Zionism. Oh, you have to study all of these things before you can understand the the the, the so-called uh, or write a a history of Jews. Now they have a book out now. You probably know about this book. Written by Salomo Sand, S L O M O S A N D. Salomo Sand teaches at uh, at the Tel Aviv University in the legal state of Israel. He teaches over there. He waited until he got his ten year tenure before he came out with this book about eight years ago. The, this book is entitled. The invention of the Jewish people. So how can you write a history of some some people or some characters that are deemed people, people or persons, persons or humans, who are deemed people that was invented? How can you write a, a history of that? You can't do it. So that's I decided. I said that can't be done. You cannot write a picture. I'm sorry, a history of a group as known as Jews because Sonomo Sand 
who teaches at the Tel Aviv University in, Paris, in, 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 in the illegal state of Israel, wrote a book called The Invention of a Jewish People. So that in, ended that. You can't write one. How can you write a history of something that's been invented? Unless you keep writing, putting mythology on top of mythology on top of mythology. You see? So that is the reason why um, the history of uh, uh, the historical origin of Judaism has not been written by Walter Williams. It can't be done, Brother Bay. Right. Well, that may, that's a that's a good point. You know, um, we had a question um, from I am the universe, and they were saying, "Well, you're referring to Jewish uh, with Jew with a Jew and the uh, word Jewish be two different things, or you cannot you cannot apply any type of name to an invented people. The invention always remember." Salomo Sand came out with this book about eight years ago. It's entitled The Invention of the Jewish People, so you can't apply anything to them, to those, those, those characters. See? And there's a book out called The Original Torah, written by another, a rabbi who teaches at the Hebrew Union College in New York, who wrote a book called The Original Torah. S. David Sperling is his name. He said in that book, there's never been an Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Sarah, Gideon, Esau, David, or uh, Joshua. And Walter Williams says that uh, no character that's listed in the Bible ever walked the earth as human beings. See? Then you've got to study uh, Zionism. See? So now these Jews are telling you that uh, these, these characters that have been embraced by the general populace of the world, never walked the earth as human being. S. David Sperling, also in his book called The Original Torah, says this. He says, I am compelled to read the Torah allegorically because it cannot be read historically. You see that? And then there's a documentary out with uh, Morgan Freeman called In Search of God. You ever, you ever seen that documentary? Brother Bay? Brother Bay? Hello? Yes, I believe I have. Okay. Well, now, in this documentary uh, uh, that features Morgan Freeman, who is in search of... Of God, that's the title of this document, In Search of God. Right, I've seen, uh, I've seen a few of those episodes, probably about maybe three. Okay, now, in, in one point in this documentary, uh, Morgan Freeman is over in the illegal state of Israel. He's invited into the home of a female rabbi to, to have dinner with him. He is sitting at their table, and this... A female rabbi told Morgan Freeman, because they was talking about the Bible, she says this, the Bible is not a history book, but a book of ideas. She told Morgan Freeman again, the Bible is not a history book, but a book of ideas. So it's impossible for anybody to write the historical origin of Islam. I'm sorry, the historical origin of Judaism. Mm-hmm. Because you keep going around and you keep revolving. You will not evolve. You keep round and round like that rat in that cage. It's running and running and running. You ain't getting no place. Mm-hmm. See? So then you got to study Zionism. you got to study uh, political Zionism. And you got to study social Zionism. So, and what the Zionists did by taking those characters out of the Bible and, and the stories that's attached to those characters called Jews and created an, a homeland which is based off of a lie for these characters in the Bible. They're called Jews. Okay? So all that has to be brought into being. 
Socialist Zionism, political Zionism. Socialist Zionism was created by Nathan Birnbaum, 1890. Political Zionism was created by Abdullah Herschel, 1896. Go forth and so on. So that's what I have to say about that, uh, Dr. Bay. Okay. All right. And, and speaking of Morgan Freeman and his um, series, In Search of God, um, you know, what other things did you find interesting in that? Because that was an interesting um, series, which I only got a chance to probably watch about three um, episodes in its entirety and some snippets, you know, later on. Uh-huh. But I would definitely like to go back and watch the whole thing because I did find it very interesting. Um, so, you know, what else did you find in there in which that, you know, something in which that, you know, the audience can go back and probably do some research on or, you know? Well, that's the only thing of interest that I found because uh, they're okay. in search of God, see? All you got to do right. is find your father who and your mother, who is your goddess, and your father is your God who had a sexual intercourse between the two to bring you forth into this world. Now, what they're doing, they're out there looking for a mythical God based on religion, the religious God, and you're not going to find it. It's not there. So that's what I have to say to that. Okay. Okay. Well, what, bro? Well, uh, well, you did. You also did speak what do you about think about, about the Bible being a science book? Repeat that again. Some people say that the, the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah are, sci- are, are science books. That's what that's what I heard. But what is, what is your take on that? I don't have, I told you my take on it. Okay. First place, take the Bible, the Quran, and all religious literature to the nearest garbage can and get it out of your life. That's number one. You cannot uh, uh, make the Bible a science book when it's based off of uh, lies, okay. words, metaphors, non-humans. How can you... Uh, now, these uh, guys who uh, who does metaphysics out here trying to take this Bible and try to metaphysicalize the Bible, it can't do, you can't do that. See? Okay. The Bible, you, 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 that's your own interpretation of the Bible. All right. So you can't, no, you can't, it's no science book. It's the rabbi told you there's a book of ideas. It's not a history book. I mean, that's it. So don't try to make the Bible into something that will never be. It won't be that because you're dealing with non-humans. Right. That's true. So that's it. That's very true. Mm-hmm. A lot of plagiarizations. And so forth and so on. Okay. Dr. Bay? I'm here. All right. Okay. Let's see. All right. Um, once again, for those that's willing to call in, give us a call at 626-414-3535. That is 626-414-3535. Give us a call. All right. Um, we have 10 minutes left. Brother L, you have anything you want to say? Any closing statements? Uh, yes, uh, once again, uh, it was uh, an experience talking uh, with your brother, uh, Walter Williams. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, I appreciate you and Dr. Uh, Bay. Right. I, I look forward to seeing you, uh, speaking with you again. Okay. I'm looking forward to the same thing. All right. Dr. Bay. All and right. You. Well, we definitely going to have you on again. We appreciate you coming. And um, people have a lot of comments. But I wish they would definitely would have called in, you know. Right. Um, but you know that's in the chat room area, and I kept giving them numbers. So, um, but they asking me the questions, and I'm like, well, you can get it from him. You know, he's right here. Just simply call right. in. Um, but 
you know, uh, that's how it goes. We had, um, we did have several calls um, tonight, so I guess we're going to um, deal with um, with those who called in. They got their questions answered, and um, we're going to invite you again, and we enjoyed you as usual. Um, you make people think, and that's why we have you on, because we have to think. You know, I can't dictate a thought to a person, so we got to have a different pot you know, to stir up, you know, so that, you know, we can go out and do some research and study. A lot of people now just want to, you know, get information from off the Internet. You know, they don't want to read books any longer. And that's a problem, you know, for the computer age right now. Yes, you know, is. when there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. You know, okay. when I know, you know, yeah, well, I know when I was coming up, I had to read hundreds and thousands of books in order to just to come to realization of um, like what you were talking about. You know, um, and moving away from um, a religion um, type of philosophy, you know, ideology, you know, um, you know. So, I mean, that's just what has to happen. So we just have to continue doing our research and and getting the information out there. And I appreciate you, um, Professor Walter Williams, because you have done a marvelous job. And um, I can't wait till your book, you know, you and your wife book come out. Um, I'm going to be getting that one too and adding to my collection. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Bay. And can I uh, leave with the listening audience uh, my email contact? Yes, give them everything. Uh, if an individual wants to contact me, you can contact me at ancientegyptian at msn.com. That's my email, ancient, A-N-C-I-E-N-T, Egyptian, E G Y. P T I A N at M S N dot com. If you email me, put your phone number there. I'll call you back, and we can further uh, our conversation. And I can further my conversation with you. So again, email me when you do. Put your uh, phone number there. I'll get back to you. And in the meantime. Uh, my two books, The Historical Origin of Christianity uh, and The Historical Origin of Islam, is on sale. You can uh, order it through Amazon, Barnes and & Noble, or your local African bookstore uh, where you live. You can go there and ask for my book, and they will be able to have the book in their stock, or they can order the book for you. And if you want to, you can uh, call the Chicago number, the Underground Bookstore. It's one of my distributors of the book, my two books. The phone number there is 773-768-8869. area code, 768 8869. And you can ask for my two books, and you can uh, purchase them there uh, from Brother Yoel, and he'll mail them out to you. Or you can go online at Amazon or go to your local African bookstore where you live, and you can get those two books. And I want to thank uh, Brother Bay. I want to thank my other brother, uh, his co uh, host, for being such gracious and uh, well-rounded individuals. Uh, you all gave me an opportunity, and I certainly appreciate that. I am humbled by that, uh, that you allowed me to come on your radio station to talk to our African community. So, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And to all, I say, may I hotel. And Brother Bay, if it's possible, yes. can you uh, email me this show tonight? Oh, yes, definitely. i get it right okay. out to you. Okay. Thank you again uh, for everything. And to your wife. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank her. And my eye holds up to you. That's right. So I know she's your backbone. Like my wife is my backbone. So oh, yes. we have to have, have wives like uh, I have, wives like you have to be in our corner, to make us the man or the men that we should be. Indeed. So to her and 
to all the African sisters out there listening, I love you, I admire you, I adore you. And I want to say to you, sisters, may I hotep. That's the reason why I put, uh, I never use the term hotep because that's female. I'm sorry, what am I saying? Hotep is male. Mayat is female. So I always add that female to give the male balance. My wife gives me balance. Your wife, uh, Brother Bay, gives you balance. And uh, our wives give us balance. So sure, indeed. she is mayat. You have to give that uh, to the women. It's mayat, which is love, and hotep which is the male, which is peace. So together, you have cosmic human balance. So I say to the sisters and the brothers, I love you. Keep on listening and keep on researching. And if there's any information that I can give you, I'll give it to you freely with love. To that, I say, may I hold up until the next time. My yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor yeah. Walter Williams. Thank you. All right, Brother L. Um, we had a good show tonight, as usual. Um, for yeah. those who continue needs to study, that's what I do recommend, research, study, study, study. That's what the name of the game is. You hear here on planet Earth, you're in the flesh, that's what you need to do is research and study. And, of course, there's some things in which that you might still have questions about, but that's life, right. um, you know. Um, so let's do that, all right, study. And um, we out of here. We thank you all for listening to First Water Radio. And we got the song coming up in which that is very powerful, all right, in which that is my homie. Brother Blackwater, also referred to as Brother Elohe, he in the joint is called um, Trap or Freedom. And um, you might want to listen to the words because it's definitely powerful, you know, Trapped or Freedom. All right? So check it out. Yeah. ATD. Above the Dome. Trap of freedom, the family, tradition, heritage, the missing links, spiritual miracles, the awakening, the walking sphinx, the time to eat, food for thought, the meta magician. Holy rainwater flows off my altar, channel through the seasons, elevate the reasons. What's the purpose of life to the living, death to the conscious, at the end of days, clash of the titans. Zombies running rampant, Christ in the pamper, looking for a lamp, revving at the church, plugging in the amp, rock of the ages, son of the undead, vampire, a moral rage, I bleed red ink on the page, words and truth, no signature, tis the blur from invisible literature, sitting at the dock of the face with Otis, having rituals, turn the lights off, he can get real quick, sir, milk and pot mix, I'm in search for a fix, walking backwards, looking forwards, Patiently waiting, don't ignore it, holding two swords like peace signs aimed at your wood.
local, way above, yet so below. The permanency of non movement, ATV, above the dome, the trap of freedom, black water, the metal magician, mad scientist on the track, peace.